My role is a psychological well-being practitioner and I work with children and young people who have low to moderate mental health issues. The treatment that I use is called cognitive behavioural therapy and this is an evidence-based treatment that's used commonly to treat a range of mental health conditions. It's most commonly used to treat anxiety and depression, but it has been shown to be an effective way of treating a number of different mental health conditions. And what it does is it helps people manage any psychological difficulties by trying to change the way they think and behave. CBT is very much a treatment rooted in the here and now. It's unlikely to delve into the cause of a person's condition unless that has a direct impact on what's going on for the person at the current time. Instead, it's more concerned with what maintains the difficulties for the person. It's also a collaborative treatment, so clients don't have CBT done to them. They work with the practitioner during therapy and are central to completing the therapeutic tasks. CBT, as the name suggests, has two central themes. The first is the cognitive element, that people's emotions, reactions to situations and behaviours are strongly influenced by cognitions, i.e. thoughts, beliefs and interpretations of themselves and the situations in which they find themselves. So often we as human beings believe that situations upset or distress us. So when asked why we're fed up, we might reply that we've had an argument with a friend or a partner, suggesting that that argument or situation has affected us. However, this can't be completely right. It can't be that simple because if it was so, the same event would give rise to the same feelings for everybody who experienced it. But we know that people react differently to similar events. Therefore, there must be something other than the event that determines emotion. CBT says that this something is cognition. And perhaps the best way to illustrate this is to use an example. So, we open our curtains one morning and we see that it's been snowing outside. And this event can lead to a number of different thoughts, which then might lead to a number of different feelings. So for example, one person might look out of the window and go, oh, snow, great. I can build a snowman or go sledging. I love snow. So this thought is likely to give rise to a happy emotion. Another person might see the snow and go, oh no, snow, oh, I've got to get to college and what if I fall over and what if I hurt myself and what if I end up getting behind or what if loads of people see me and laugh at me? And this sort of cognition gives rise to feelings of anxiety. A third person might open the curtains and go, oh, snow, I hate snow. What's the point of getting up? What's the point of going to college? I'll just miss the bus or it'll be late or it won't come and I'll miss my classes and I may as well just go back to bed. And this sort of cognition can give rise to feelings of depression. So in simple terms, how we feel is influenced by what we think. And the two together then influence the other element, CBT, the behavioural element. So cognitive behavioural therapy considers that our behaviour, i.e. what we do, is crucial in maintaining and then changing our psychological state. So often when we are anxious or depressed, we adapt our behaviour to try and lessen the feelings of anxiety or cope with feelings of depression. We tend to avoid situations that make us feel uncomfortable or we might adapt our behaviour and put other behaviours in, what we call safety behaviours, to help us cope. This seems sensible in the short term and it might temporarily lessen our feelings of anxiety. However, long term, it doesn't give us the opportunity to learn that our thoughts may not be factual and that there may be a different way, a more positive way of dealing with the situation. So, if we go back to our snow example, 
if someone had the anxiety provoking or the depressive cognition, then their behaviour may have had a crucial effect on whether that state persisted. If they got back into bed or they decided not to go to college that day because they were too worried they might have an accident or they were sure that everything would go wrong, then they wouldn't have the opportunity to see that their thoughts might not have been right because our thoughts are our opinions, they're not always fact. However, if they did go into college, they might have discovered that those predictions were wrong and that they could have had a chance to make or, or to have a positive experience and thus be less likely to think negatively in the future. So, how does CBT work? Well, it goes back to these thoughts and behaviours. So all of these are thoughts, our feelings, our physical symptoms and our behaviours are interrelated and all have an impact on each other. So with psychological disorders, CBT would see that one of these isn't working properly. And so the therapist would work with the person to make changes in usually thoughts and behaviours. And these might be small changes that would then go on to have an impact in all the other areas because they're interrelated. The aim of therapy is to teach the person to apply these skills to their own daily life. So it should help them manage their problems and stop them having, stop the problems having a negative impact on life after the course of treatment finishes because they're being taught skills. So as mentioned, um, CBT often works with anxiety and depression. And so depression is one of the most common mental health problems. Globally, it's considered to be one of the leading causes of disability. Cognitive behavioural therapists are most concerned with how it's triggered and maintained, not how it was caused in the first place. So the practitioner will work with the client to map out their response to their low mood. And by considering the possible links between all of these, what we call the maintenance cycle, then they can, the person can begin to understand how the depressed mood may be triggered and sustained. So, for example, the thoughts might go down the path of, oh, college is really hard, I'm never going to pass my course, I'm really struggling, which then might make them feel quite low and down and maybe a little bit depressed and feel as though they're struggling. The physical symptoms might be that they find it hard to concentrate and that they end up feeling very tired all the time. And so because of that, they might avoid going to college and that would lead them getting further behind. So all of these then affect each other and it becomes a bit of a vicious cycle. So a person starts to feel low and they are tired and they're lacking in energy and they might feel sad, upset and irritable and a bit hopeless and it can be really hard to motivate themselves. And what happens when a person starts feeling like this is that they stop often doing things. And this includes the things that they used to enjoy because they don't have the energy to do them. They can't be bothered. They don't think it'll be fun anymore. So they might start isolating themselves from people and stop doing things. And this means that they start to get less out of life and feel that they haven't achieved anything. And that means that they're going to start to feel even lower because when we get less out of life and life doesn't seem like it, it has much worth or much point, then we start to feel lower still. And then those physical 
and emotional feelings become even more intense. And so we enter this vicious cycle. And a person might feel that nothing will ever change. The way that CBT treats depression is through something called behavioural action. And the aim is to reverse this cycle. So the therapist will work with the person to identify activities that are meaningful to that person. So the focus of the intervention takes place here and they will ask the person to think about what is really important in their lives. So it might be what did they used to do before they started feeling depressed that they really enjoy and gradually they'll try and put some of these back into a person's life. There is loads of research and evidence that say that if we start to introduce meaning act meaningful activities again, then life starts to feel better and we start to get more out of life again. And so this vicious cycle is reversed and people start to feel better about themselves, the world and their future. So the other very common disorder that CBT treats is anxiety. Anxiety stems from our fight or flight instinct. So it's a very basic response to a perceived threat or dangerous situation. In primitive times, people wouldn't have survived long without it. It's essential in keeping us safe when responding to threats. And essentially what happens is that during a threatening situation, the amygdala sends a distress signal and the hypothalamus activates the sympathetic nervous system, which responds by pumping adrenaline into the bloodstream. And this pre prepares the body to cope with the danger. It causes a range of different bodily effects. So we might see um, an increased heart rate, um, breathing might quicken, blood goes to the large muscle groups, eyesight can become more well focused on the threat and thoughts um, often start to race as the brain tries to look for a best response away from the to get the person out of the dangerous situation. Now for somebody who is having these or experiencing these bodily feelings while sitting on a bus, this can be misinterpreted. So the fast heartbeat, the quick breathing, maybe they're having a heart attack. Um, and we call it catastrophic misinterpretation and where the symptoms are misinterpreted as serious health issues and that can lead the panic to get worse. Even if the person is aware that these are not serious health issues, it can still make the situation feel incredibly uncomfortable. So people experiencing anxiety have the fight or flight response as we all do, but it's oversensitive to a threat and reacts often when there isn't in fact any danger, just a perception of danger. So people with anxiety often have negative, anxious thoughts that predict the worst happening and them not being able to cope. This can lead that person to avoiding stressful situations or adapting their behavior, leaving a social event early for example, being on the phone all the time, so that they don't have to cope directly with that situation. And again, we can end up in a vicious cycle. So going back to our, our vicious cycle of, of thoughts, feelings, symptoms and behaviour. So a person might think something bad's going to happen. I'm really not going to be able to cope or I'm going to be embarrassed or humiliated by something. They start to feel anxious intense and stressed or maybe panicky. The physical symptoms then kick in as the adrenaline goes into the body. So the heart rate might quicken, shortness of breath, muscle tension might start to feel headachey. And this might lead to behaviour of trying to get out of the situation, avoiding it um, in the longer term, not going out at all, leaving places early, only going to places with somebody else, etc. That then 
leads to thoughts of, well, if I go back there, I'm going to be anxious again um, and I'm going to look really stupid. Uh, and so the vicious cycle continues. So the way that we would work with anxiety in CBT is to challenge the thoughts because thoughts are thoughts. They're not facts. They're the mind's way of trying to interpret the world around us, but they're not factual. So these thoughts that cause the anxiety sometimes get it wrong. So what we would do is to try and challenge these thoughts. And there's a, a range of different ways in which we can do it. Um, and it very much depends on how the anxiety manifests manifests itself as to uh, which pathway we might choose. However, the first course of action is often to recognise the thoughts. What we call negative automatic thoughts are these negative thoughts that just pop into our head. They're like instant commentaries that we make about every situation. They're always unhelpful and they're generally unconscious. We, we are not aware that we're thinking them. We're just aware of the feeling that they, they elicit. They often take the form of what if? What if I fall over? What if somebody laughs at me? What if they see me make a fool of myself? We all have them. Um, um, that by their very nature, they're unpleasant and they're negative and they're generally inaccurate and distorted, but nonetheless, they're really convincing. Often they stem from core beliefs, beliefs that represent our enduring attitudes about ourselves and the world that might be central to our identity. So what we need to do is to identify these thoughts because once we've identified them, and that in itself can take some time, but then we can start to categorise them and see them for what they are. Once we've categorised them, we can see, or, or this can allow us to take a step back and we can see them for what they really are and then start to challenge them and start to test them to maybe try and learn that, that actually, in this case, they're not necessarily factual and that what they're telling us isn't necessarily the truth. And by starting to do this, we might be able to go into these anxiety creating situations and expose ourselves gradually to them to start to desensitize the fight or flight response. And this is the main way in which CBT would work with anxiety. So whilst it, CBT will work with a range of different um, areas and, and does provide a range of different interventions. Most of the interventions stem from looking at this cycle here and trying to make these small changes that might then have an impact on all other areas.